right, welcome back. So today we have two orders of business. The first one is to finish up talking about sorting. So we're gonna do that. We're going to talk about quick sort. Last time we got to the point where we saw how to partition, we'll remind ourselves about how to do that, and then we'll talk about quick sort runtime. And uh, at this point, we're through the sorting algorithms that we wanna talk about this semester. So we'll also take a step back and kind of compare them to each other, think a little bit about what some of the trade-offs are. In the second third of class or so, we're gonna start talking about uh, a topic that I'm very excited about and something that we'll talk about for the next couple of lectures. Um, something we're talking about for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's something that you should know as a technologist, as a computer scientist. It's a feature of your life and it's a, uh, one of the sort of proudest accomplishments of this field. Um, the other thing is, this is something that is going to be um, something you'll be using as part of your final project, which you're gonna start on Monday. So we're gonna talk about the internet. We're gonna talk a little bit about the World Wide Web and eventually we're gonna talk a little bit more about web APIs. Uh, you're already, you've already been exposed to them sort of in a, a small way on MP3 where you worked uh, with the Cognitive Services API, but we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about what went on behind the scenes this will help prepare you to work on your final project and to build something that's very cool, because this is the best way to do it. All right, so let's start off by reviewing quick sort. So we talked about merge sort last time, which is a sorting algorithm that uses the fact that it's O-N to merge two sorted arrays. And so if I break an array down into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually I get to a point where I have an array of size one, which is sorted, and then I can start building up my sorted array by combining those small sorted arrays into larger sorted arrays using this merge function. But then we looked at another way to solve the sorting problem recursively, and that was this, um, this approach called quick sort. And quick sort works differently than merge sort. Instead of you know, breaking the problem down into smaller pieces and then solving it as we go up, quick sort actually ends up sorting the array as it breaks it into smaller pieces. And so, the basis of quick sort, we're not actually going to finish implementing quick sort in class, mainly because it's fairly trivial um, once you have the partition part, which we went over last time. So what do we do, just quickly reload this guy. So what do we do, um, how does quick sort work? So let's, let's review this. So the idea behind quick sort is in every step of the algorithm, quick sort chooses a value from the array. So it's called a pivot. And then quicksort partitions the array into two smaller subarrays, values that are smaller than the pivot and values that are larger than the pivot, okay? Now, an interesting thing here is that the pivot value always ends up in the right spot, but the other values in the array don't. There's no guarantee that the two smaller arrays are sorted. In fact, they're usually not. And so to continue the process, we then apply the same algorithm to the smaller subarrays that we created in, in each step. So we take an array, pick a value, partition the array into values smaller and values larger. And now we can, we can essentially partition those smaller subarrays independently of each other. And this is important to note because there are no values in the first subarray that belong in the second subarray and vice versa. All right, so let's watch how this works. So here I'm gonna pick a pivot value of eight this is one way to pick the pivot, which is to pick the first value in the unsorted array. So I pick my pivot of eight, and now I'm gonna partition the array into two parts. I have values on the left side that are smaller than eight, and values on the right side that are larger than eight. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, the left side is not sorted yet. We're not done. The right side happens to be sorted, but that's only because it's of size one. Something else I want you to notice, again, is that eight is in the right spot. Eight, when I, the one thing that quicksort does do is it moves the pivot value into the right spot in the array. So eight, I'm done with. I don't have to think about it again. Eight is in the right location. However, one other thing to notice here that's important when we start talking about quicksort runtime is that this partitioning process does not guarantee that the two subarrays are going to be the same size. In merge sort, I can always break the array into whatever size pieces I wanted and merge them together. And so in merge sort, I'm essentially allowed to break the array into to roughly the same size pieces at every step. Quick sort can't get away with that. In quick sort, the size of the subarrays depends on the pivot value that I chose. And that's gonna play an important role when we start talking about 
how long quicksort takes to run, okay? So here you can see I have a fairly uneven partition. This isn't quite the worst case. The worst case is if I picked the largest value. So imagine if I had picked 11 as the pivot, I would have all the values that were smaller than 11, and 11 would be the pivot value, and essentially I wouldn't have even broken the problem into two smaller pieces. I would have only broken into one slightly smaller piece. Here I'm a little bit better, but still I have one subarray that I've created of size six and a second one of size one. So again, I don't get to guarantee that the subarrays that are created when I partition my larger array are the same size. In many cases, they're not. All right, well, let's keep going here. So now I've created two smaller problems. I need to sort this array, first array of size six, and then I need to sort that second array of size one. Well, the second array of size one's already done. We know that an array of size one is sorted, but I can restart my algorithm on the front half of the array. So I do the same thing. I pick a pivot value. In this case, again, my uh, algorithm for picking the pivot is to choose the first value. And I partition this small array into two parts. Here I did a little better in terms of breaking the array into equal size pieces. I've got three values that were smaller than five and two values that were larger than five. Now again, I just want to drive this home. This is important to understand in terms of how quicksort works. The reason I can get away with this is because I can treat this array and this array separately. Because I know that, again, there are no values in this array that belong on this side of eight. And there are no values in this subarray that belong on the other side of eight. So I've created two independent problems. Again, you kind of see how you can start to apply recursion to this, because essentially I can restart quicksort on this subarray, which is a smaller subarray that's unsorted, I still need to sort and I can restart the quicksort algorithm on the right subarray, which in that case is easy because it's of size one. All right, so I'm gonna partition my um, left subarray. That's created two smaller problems to solve. Now I have an array of size two that I still need to sort, and an array of size three that I still need to sort. And again, I can treat these problems independently because the values that are on the right side of five belong in that part of the array, and the values that are on the left side of the five also belong in that part of the array. Five is also in the right spot. All right, so I just continue this process. So now I'm partitioning the left subarray that's of size three, the right subarray that's of size two, and eventually you can see that at every stage in the, in the process, I'm creating smaller and smaller problems. And this is one of the things that we need about recursive algorithms in order for them to work. They have to make the problem smaller. Every time I do this, I'm at least making the problem one size smaller, because the pivot value is in the right spot. Even if I do a terrible job of picking the pivot, and I pick the largest value, the pivot is still in the right spot in the array. So I've reduced a problem of size n to a problem of size n minus one. Now that's not gonna work very well when we talk about the complexity analysis, but it will eventually lead to a solution. So I know that eventually, if I keep applying this partitioning step, I'm getting smaller and smaller arrays. And eventually here, now I've created three arrays of size one that I need to sort, but those are done. And the algorithm has finished. Questions about this? Again, I think compared to merge sort, quick sort is a little bit uh, trickier to understand. It's a little more mysterious in terms of how it works, right? Merge sort is kind of like, okay, I get it. I can merge things together and I can eventually build up larger sorted arrays. Um, quick sort, there's this sort of fascinating a uh, process that's happening as the algorithm works its way down, where it's almost like the array is being sorted by magic, but it's not magic, it's just an algorithm. Questions about this before we go on? All right, and then, so we looked at a single step. We looked at a partition, right? And what we do in the partition, we actually implemented this last time, I'm not gonna do it again. I'm not sure I can do it twice in a row successfully, um, but, you know, we pick a value from the array as our, as our pivot, and we keep track of two things. We essentially keep track of the part of the, of the array that's smaller than the pivot and the part that's larger than the pivot. When I see a value that's smaller, I move it into the smaller part. When I see a value that's larger, I just keep going. So now I've got three, and the way to move three into the smaller part is to swap it with seven. Now we keep going. Now I've got four. Again, the way to move it into the smaller part is to swap it with seven. I've got 11. 11 is bigger, so I keep going. I've got eight. Eight is larger, I keep going, and I've got negative one. Negative one is also smaller. And so I'm gonna swap it with seven, and I'm gonna move the, my reference to where the smaller part of the array starts one slot forward. 
essentially this pointer is telling me when you find a smaller value, this is the place to swap it with. And then I have to move that to the right to make the smaller part a little bit bigger. Here I'm almost done. The last thing I need to do is get six into the right spot. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put six at the very right of the smaller part of the array. And I'm gonna do that again by swapping it with whatever value is there. So now I'm done. I've got this part of the array. Now again, it's really important to point this out. Somebody asked this last time. I have not sorted the array yet. I've only partitioned it. So again, this does not sort. If you could sort this fast, you know, you'd win a Turing award, right? This, is, this would be ON sorting. I can't sort this fast, but I can partition the array into smaller problems uh, that I can then run this algorithm on again. Okay, so now I've got a problem here of values that I need to sort. That's one problem. I've created another problem over here of size four. I started with the problem of size eight. Now I have a problem of size three and a problem of size four, okay? So I have two smaller subproblems. Again, the other important thing to notice is that this, I can solve this completely independently of this problem because there's no values that we need to move across the partition. There's no values from the right that should go to the left. There's no values from the left that should go to the right. That's the trick of partitioning the array. It creates two independent problems. Essentially, I could give one of you this problem to work on and somebody else this problem to work on. You don't have to communicate with each other at all. Because there's no values that, that uh, you would have to swap in order to get the, the problem right. Okay, so let's talk about the best case. So where quicksort gets really interesting is runtime. Well, actually, so first of all, um, someone remind me, I already had merge sort. Merge sort was an O n log n algorithm for doing sort, right? Every merge is O n, and in merge sort, I can actually provide a really strong guarantee that the number of times I'm gonna have to call merge is log n, log base two n in the size of the problem because I'm breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces every time, and I can do that evenly. Why are we talking about quicksort? It seems like I've already got this algorithm that works beautifully, very well, so why am I up here rambling about quicksort? What's better about quicksort? Why bother with this at all? Because the runtime is gonna get bad in certain cases, right? I already have an algorithm with guaranteed O n log n runtime. I know you guys might get a chance to prove this later that that's the best that a sorting algorithm can do given random data. Why am I talking about quicksort? What is better about it? Yeah. Yeah, so remember, in order to implement merge sort, at minimum, I need an entire extra array of the same size as the input. So if I've got a billion values to sort, you might think that this, you might, how many people think that's like a, a silly problem? Who would ever want to sort a billion values or a trillion values, right? Like Google does this all the time, right? Facebook does this all the time. Like these problems are built into the scale of the data that they're analyzing. That's why when you go on the, the uh, Jim Gray Sorting Challenge webpage, their challenges are now up to like sorting trillions of records. That's what you have to do in order to win, right? People work with data sets that are this size. This is not an academic problem. So if I've got a billion records or a trillion records and I have to, you know, I, they already take up a bunch of space and memory and I have to have double the amount in order to sort them, that's a limitation of merge sort. It needs a lot of extra space, a lot of extra memory, a lot of extra disk. I need somewhere to store all these intermediate results that the algorithm needs to use as it goes on. In quicksort, notice that when I'm doing this partition, I'm essentially just swapping things around in the same array. I need a temporary value to store things so that I can do my swaps, but essentially quicksort needs very little extra space, which is nice, okay? So, so now the question is how does it perform? So, let's talk about the best case. So in the best case for quicksort, I choose a pivot value that happens to divide the array into roughly equal pieces every time. So imagine I happen, I get lucky, and I choose a pivot that takes an eight size array into two four, roughly one three, one four, you know, a four size array into two twos, roughly one one and one two, because the pivot isn't included. But essentially, imagine that I choose a pivot value that breaks the array into roughly even pieces. So now I get runtime performance that's very similar to quicksort. So my first partition takes, and again, 
I'm, I'm approximating here because we don't include the pivot, but this is just, you know, for the sake of argument, right? So my first step, I, so let's say I start with eight values, right? I partition the array into two arrays of roughly size four. My second step, I partition those two uh, arrays of size four into four arrays of size two. And in my third step, I'm partitioning those uh, four arrays of size two to uh, two, eight arrays of size one, right? And when I have an array of size one, I know that I'm done. That's the point at which uh, we know that quicksort has finished. Partitioning is O-N. If we had the code up, and you guys can look at it from last time, right, and you'll have a chance to implement it, I think, today or tomorrow, right? If I had the partitioning code up, you can see that that's O-N. It does one loop through the, um, through the array. So my partition is O-N, and I have, for an array of size eight, three levels. And so this is coming back to me. This is sort of looks like merge sort, right? Given an array of size eight, I've got three levels. Three is eight log base two. Um, if I had six, an array of size 16, I would have one more level. If I have an array of size 32, I would have one more level. And so what I'm seeing is that familiar log n, log base 2n performance that I liked about merge sort. So again, in the best case, in quick sort, I get the performance of merge sort with a lot less space. So that's the, that's the ideal case, okay? All right, here's the problem, though. I don't always get the best case. In merge sort, I have a lot of confidence. It doesn't matter what the data looks like in the array. I'm always gonna get O n log n. I know that. I can put it money in the bank. With quick sort, I have to think about this more carefully. So let's think about the worst possible uh, case for quick sort. Let's imagine that in uh, every step, we choose by accident a pivot that is either the maximum or the minimum value in the array, okay? So, here's the problem. My first partition, what do I get? I actually get one array of size seven, right? Because the pivot doesn't even count. The pivot ends up in the right spot. I've got seven values left, okay? Uh-oh, this is starting to look like a problem. So again, I, I'm, I'm like, okay, maybe I got unlucky, right? But again, I try again. I take that smaller array of size seven and I try to partition it. But again, I pick the minimum or maximum value. And so I end up with an array of size six that I still need to partition. Okay, I'm gonna keep trying. Imagine the third time, now I create an array of, you know, uh, and so what's, ha what's happening here? The problem is only getting one spot smaller every time. And so rather than three partitions to do an array of size eight, I'm gonna end up with eight partitions. Every one of those partitions is O-N, so what is my quick sort algorithm in the worst case? In the best case, it's O-N log N. Log N levels, N steps per partition. In the worst case, it's looking like O oh, n squared, yeah. N partitions, each of which only makes the problem one unit smaller, each partition takes O n time. So I've got N partitions, each one of which is O n, I've got an N squared algorithm here in the worst case. So this is, you know, again, why it's fun and sort of interesting to talk about quicksort is because we have this strong input dependence. If I get lucky, I get great performance, with the minimal amount of space. If I get unlucky, I get miserable performance. I might as well run insertion sort. It's got the same uh, runtime in, in the worst case. So again, here's another way to think about it, right? So if I choose, now, now, then, now here's also an interesting input, right? Because this is sorted in reverse order. So again, if I, if I partition this array, here's what it looks like when I'm done. Now I'm gonna do this again, I partition again. Well, here's what it looks like when I'm done. Now I have an array of size six. I partition it again. Here's what it looks like when I'm done. Now I have an array of size five to partition. I partition again. Here's what it looks like when I'm done. So rather than the problem breaking into smaller and smaller pieces that are roughly you know, the same size and I can attack, it's only getting one unit smaller every time. Just questions about this. Now, what's something that um, is potentially dangerous about this? 
let me go back and show you the starting point for this, uh, okay? Why might I worry about this input? So this is a potential input for quicksort. It's an array that's sorted in reverse order. Why might I be concerned about this if I was using quicksort in my, as part of my code? This comes back to something about data you find in the real world that we've mentioned a couple of times. It's something that algorithms like TimSort take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah, so this data is sorted. This also happens if it was sorted in ascending order, right? So if I run, if, if I implement quicksort poorly, and I do a bad job of picking the pivot, but again, I'm doing a, a simple job, I'm just picking the first value. But if you do quicksort this way, what you will find is that you get worst case performance on already sorted data, okay? That is not good. Because as we pointed out, a lot of times sorting algorithms get run on data sets that are mostly sorted. You know, it's like I put something new in and I kinda need to find the right spot for it, but a lot of times I'm running a sort repeatedly on data to maintain some property of it. For example, to maintain a sorted property so you can do binary search, which you guys are doing in lab. And so a lot of times, I'm not starting with random data. I'm starting with data that was just sorted a few minutes ago and I added a few values to. Or maybe I removed a few values from and I need to make sure that it's still, that it's still sorted. Right? So a lot, it's, it's common to run a sorting algorithm on data that's pretty close to being sorted. If my sorting algorithm has worst case performance on already sorted data, this is not good. Okay? So we need to think a little bit harder about how to use quicksort. Okay. So here's what we, what we try to do, right? So essentially, if you read about quicksort, they explain the algorithm, and then there's this like long chunk about how to choose a pivot value. Because the performance of quicksort on real data starts to become very dependent on how you choose a pivot. So here are ways to choose bad pivot values, right? A, a way to choose a bad, one way to choose bad pivot values is to choose the first value. So that fails, the slide is, is wrong. That fails both if the array is sorted in ascending and descending order. So if the array is already sorted, choosing the first or the last value in the uh, subarray fails. It produces O n squared, okay? So that's not good. Again, last value, same thing. First or last value will fail. They don't partition the array. They just, you know, the first or last value is essentially already in the right spot, right? And so they don't, they don't help us. Here's a better way to do things. So one way is to choose a random value. Um, the other way, so we, we pointed out last time that the value that quicksort would like to use is the median. However, I can't compute the median of the data because doing that requires that I sort the array which is the thing I'm trying to do. So I can't compute a median without sorting the data, which is the algorithm tr I'm, I'm trying to implement. What I can do, however, is I can pick like three values at the front of the array, and I can choose the median of those three. So essentially I'm taking a tiny sample, let's say I have an array with a thousand values in it, I can't find the actual median because that requires sorting, but I can take three values at random and I can choose the median of those three values. The idea is that this is supposed to approximate in some level the median of the entire array, right? But again, you can read, you know, lots of detailed description about how to try to do this better um, on Wikipedia and on, you know, if, if you want to learn more about this. Okay, so let's put up our table for quicksort. Time, best case is O n log n. Again, that's if we choose good pivot values. Worst case, O n squared. Average case on random data, even with poor pivot value selection, is O n log n. So if you give quicksort random data, you can choose the first value as the pivot, and it does pretty well. The problem is, again, most of the data that you sort in real life is not random. It's already close to being sorted. Now, space is dependent on how many levels of quicksort I actually have to run. So it's not quite constant, because Every time I call quicksort, I need a little bit of space. I need a temporary value, essentially. So it depends on how many levels I need to run. 
if quicksort only requires log n levels, then I only need log n space. In the worst case, it requires n levels, and then I need o n space, right? So that's, that's another thing about quicksort, right? In the worst case, it can actually consume as much space as merge sort. It's not good. But again, assuming that I have, you know, the average cases here are really, really hard. I probably even shouldn't have them up on the slide, because the average case for any algorithm that depends on data becomes strongly dependent on the data that is in, right? You can take one data set, run quicksort, and get O n log n performance. You can take another data set, run quicksort on it, and go get O n squared performance, right? What's the average performance? It really depends on the data. Average here, I'm talking about if you have random data that you're inputting, but again, that's not necessarily a great way to compute the average. Most data is not random. Questions about quicksort? sorting in general, because we are finished talking about it. So again, the advantage of quicksort over merge sort is that it uses less space. Um, the disadvantage is that it can, in pathological cases, well, actually, in, even in some common cases, um, consume more time. So let's now back up and talk a little bit about kind of how the algorithms, the main algorithms we talked about in class, compare with each other. Okay, so, and this is one of those um, you know, tables that you should probably, um, I wouldn't say memorize, but you should know, um, you know, when you go out and talk to people, when you do interviews, someone may certainly ask you about this, right? And this, and this really becomes a thing about knowing what your tools are, right? These are all sorting algorithms. They will all sort data. The result you get is identical. Which one you choose can depend on other features of your problem. Um, and so having some understanding of why these sorting algorithms perform the way they do is a good thing, okay? Let's go back to insertion sort. So best case runtime for insertion sort. If I pick my data set very carefully, what runtime do I get for insertion sort? Who remembers this? Yeah. Oh, when? Yeah, if I give insertion sort sorted data, the best case is already sorted, and I get ON performance, right? What about the worst case? So what's the worst case data I can give to insertion sort? Remember, I'm taking every value from the unsorted part, and I'm sticking it into the sorted part. And I'm essentially kind of comparing things as I go. So worst case performance for quicksort. If I gave you quicksort, sorry. Insertion sort. If I gave you insertion sort and said, give me an input that's going to cause it to perform as slowly as possible, what would that input be? Yeah. Yeah, sorted backwards. Because essentially every value I have to take from the left side of the unsorted part and drag it all the way to the front to the left side of the sorted part. This is what maximizes the number of times that inner loop has to run. All right. Merge sort, again. One of the things I like about merge sort, no data dependence. It doesn't care. You know, it just breaks things down, puts them back together. Where data is sort of doesn't matter, right? This is not, you know, completely technically true, right? What's one, who, who, can, who can remember when we did merge? What's one case where you could optimize merge a little bit? Who can think of this? A good, good question. Maybe this will show up on a quiz. What's a case where you could optimize merge? So I'm going through and I'm looking at both lists and I'm picking things from, from one or the other and putting it in front. There's a point at which I can stop a little earlier than I would normally be able to. When does that happen? Yeah. Yeah, but one of the lists is empty, right? So if I have one list that's all smaller than the other list, what's going to happen is I'm going to keep comparing, 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 and eventually I'm going to run out of items in the first list. At that point, I know all the items in the second list belong at the end. And remember, both lists are already sorted. So I can essentially just jam them all at the end, and I'm done. So in that case, I can get away with something like O n over 2. Right? But it doesn't, you know, so again, I'm still O n, because we tend not to care about those, those, uh, those multiplicative factors. Right? But I can get a little bit of a performance boost there. Quicksort, um, best case data for quicksort with poor pivot selection is random. But again, best and, and worst case here depends a lot on how I'm choosing the pivot value. 
Worst case is sorted, particularly if I'm choosing a pivot value poorly. If I choose the first value or the last value as my pivot, sorted data produces um, pathological behavior for Chris. All right, so, and then now here's, here's kind of our, our, our big table here. We talked a little bit about this just a minute ago. Insertion sort, best case ON. One interesting thing to note is that insertion sort, in the best case, does better than both merge sort and quick sort. Insertion sort is an algorithm that's sometimes referred to as adaptive in the sense that if you give it sorted data, it does very well. Neither quick sort or merge sort do this, right? In the best case, they're both, both n log n. In the worst case, however, is O n squared. Average case, you know, I would argue O n squared. Merge sort, O n log n. Worst case, average case. No input dependence. I'm always going to do the same number of merge. Quick sort, we just discussed today. Best case, O, n log n. Worst case, O, n squared. Average case is O, n log n. Again, it's heavily dependent on algorithm for choosing the position. Okay. Finally, space. So, and again, these are, this is the trade-off space, right? I mean, this is one of the fun things about being a computer scientist. There are trade-offs between how you do everything in computer science. We're trading off time versus space. May have, maybe have a computer that has a really fast processor, but not a lot of storage, or vice versa. Insertion sort, essentially a tiny amount of extra memory, right? One thing to swap things around. Merge sort, I need a lot of extra memory. I essentially need an entire temporary array for the algorithm to use while it's running that's the same size as the array that I gave it to start with. Quick sort is O log n, and that's due to the recursive calls. Every time I restart the algorithm, it needs a constant amount of space, but you know, I have to essentially restart it long end time to finish uh, partitioning the entire array. All right, and, and again, this is one of those things where, you know, depending on what your problem is like, there are a lot of different ways to think about how to solve it. So, for example, if you have a very small array, let's say I have an array with only a couple of items that I need to sort, um, it turns out that insertion sort can actually be faster uh, than some of these other algorithms because the overhead of making these additional function calls, the recursive calls that merge sort and quick sort have to do, um, can overwhelm the benefits that you get, particularly when you have a small, small input, right? Right, if you really want predictable performance, merge sort, right? Merge sort gives you n log n. Right, and you can put that in the bank. So if there's, if you really need to know beforehand exactly how long it's gonna take to sort a certain amount of data, merge sort is a good choice. Um, if you need to conserve space, quick sort, right? Quick sort uses less space. It gives you kind of a nice trade-off. Obviously, insertion sort uses a lot less space, but insertion sort is O and squared, right? Um, you know, in, in most cases. So this is one of the ways to think about this problem, right? You know, identifying and again, one of the things you're gonna do over and over again as a computer scientist in the future uh, in a variety of different ways. Now, you probably won't be choosing sorting algorithms, right, because this is something that we've gotten better and better at, we'll talk about in a sec, but this type of thinking, identifying features of the problem, understanding how different algorithms perform under different constraints, and then using that to make an intelligent decision about how to approach a particular problem. We have lots of ways to solve the same problem, how, which one you choose, and how to do that, how to choose intelligently is something that's really important to achieving good performance on real systems. Okay, I've got a, 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 one other thing to point out about sorting. So there's this property of sorting that we refer to as stability. Um, and this is something that you'll see when, and, and, as, a, as a component when we discuss different sorting algorithms. So a sort is stable if two items with the same value. So let's say I have a, a sorting algorithm, let's say I'm sorting data and there's two items with the same value that are in my array. If those two items stay in the same order, always are in the same order they started in after the sort finishes, the sort is referred to as stable, okay? So if I've got a bunch of different items in a row with the same value and I sort it, none of them should, should move around, right? If they don't, then the sort is called unstable. So it's possible 
that I started the algorithm on a particular set of data and a couple things swapped positions uh, that were equal as far as that particular sort was concerned. Now you might wonder like why do I care about this? Why is this important? So when I'm sorting integers, I don't care because there's only one property of the integer that I would ever care about, right? But in a lot of cases, what we're doing is we're sorting data. And we're, a lot of times we're sorting data based on some attribute of the information. And it's also common to want to sort things multiple times. So for example, let's say I had this person class. Person has both an age and a name, I know. Objects, right? Like, sort of forgot about them. They're still out there. Um, so let's say I have this person class with a name and an age, and I want to sort, essentially I want you to give me a list of all the person objects in my system sorted by age, but then within each age group, I want them to be sorted by name, all right? And so the way that you do this is you take, you know, everybody, um, you sort them by name first, and then you sort them by age. In order for this to work properly, I need the sort to be stable. If the sort is unstable, then what's gonna happen is when I run the second sort, it's gonna uh, reorder objects that I didn't want it to change. Right, so you, you can, you know, ask on the forum and we'll talk about exactly how this works uh, in, in practice, right? But again, particularly when I start to sort data multiple times based on different keys, uh, stable sorting is really important for this to work correctly. Okay. So, so I, I, I promised that, that, you know, uh, sorting was still a relevant problem, and in order to try to convince you of that, I pointed out that there's this recent sorting algorithm called TimSort that's used uh, both as the default sorting algorithm in Python and now in Java as well, I think as of like Java 9. All right, so, so what does TimSort do, right? We're not gonna talk about it. It's probably would require an entire lecture to explain how TimSort works, right? You know, sorting, uh, this is one of the things you see, you know, in computer science is that, you know, I'm showing you the basic sorting algorithms, but the stuff you see in practice in the wild tends to be more complex. However, if you read about TimSort, what you'll find out is it's based on the sorting algorithms that we've already talked about, okay? So essentially, let's go back to our table. Okay. So look at the table here. And in particular, look at insertion sort and merge sort. Right? So the, the idea is, in insertion sort, if I've got already sorted data, I can get um, O, N performance. But in merge sort, um, the worst case performance I can get is O, N log N. So I'd kind of like something that has both of these properties. I'd kind of like an algorithm that, when presented with already sorted data, gets me O, N. But if presented with unsorted data, can't do worse than O and log N. Now, insertion sort is not that algorithm because the insertion sort, the best case is O N. Worst case is O N squared. Merge sort is also not that algorithm because the best case for merge sort is O N log N. So again, I want the best case from insertion sort and the worst case from merge sort. That's, that's one way to think about what Tim sort is doing. So one of the ways that Tim sort does this is it tries to identify, so you give it some data. It tries to identify something called a run. What is a run? A run is a sequence of data that's already sorted. So imagine I give you an array with like 10,000 elements. Tim Sort might identify that, okay, there's this chunk of the array from index 2,000 to index 4,000 that's already sorted, okay? So I can essentially kind of pull that out and then later I'm gonna merge that in with some other things that I need to do, right? So I'm trying to essentially kind of get that ON merge from merge sort um, in order to, but if I can identify these big chunks that are already sorted, I can intelligently weave them back together in a way that again, the goal here is to get at worst ON log N performance, but at best, given sorted data, close to ON. And this is what Tim Sort tries to do. If you like sorting and you like these sort of algorithms, I would certainly encourage you to go check it out. It's very interesting. You know, again, I mean, it's, it's an example of, you know, a kind of adaptive algorithm that people are, are still designing to solve real problems, right? I mean, 
there are, if, if you sometimes get this feeling in computer science that we've solved all the interesting problems, you know, think again, right? We're still solving sorting, right? Which is a problem like as old as time. Um, and so there's definitely uh, still cool stuff out in the world for you to do. Oh yeah, so this is, uh, you know, uh, multiple people have posted these, uh, these uh, videos of different sorting algorithms. We, we could watch this. Um, here's what I think I'm gonna do. I am so close to being out of time today and I don't want to start a new topic. So here's what I think I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take some questions about sorting and then we'll probably wrap up a few minutes early today and I'll put on that sorting video and if you guys are, are excited about it, you can sit here and watch stuff get sorted. It's sort of mesmerizing. Um, any questions about sorting? Or we wrap up on this topic, move on to other things. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? So as far as I know, the built-in sort in Java is now Tim sort. Right? So best case runtime is close to O n as possible. Worst case runtime, uh, O n log n. Yeah. So so. Python was the first one to pick up Tim sort. Now Java uses it. So I'm assuming that by internal, we mean that this is what's attached to like the arrays utility class. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah. What's that? So the, the question is in industry, do people use multiple sorts or do they typically use one sort for everything, right? So. So here's the thing, right? This isn't a class on computer systems, but when, when, when you start to build computer systems, there's this principle called Amdahl's Law. Amdahl's Law says, if you try to improve a part of the system, the entire system can only get as much better as the contribution of that part, right? So when you go to Google, for example, and you do a search, right? I'm sure Google knows exactly how long that search takes and why it takes that long. Right? There's some chunk devoted to this, some chunk devoted to this, some chunk devoted to that, right? And when you optimize things, so for example, if I have a, a program that takes 10 minutes to run, right? Maybe that program is doing some sorting internally, and I might think, uh-oh, my sorting is getting slow, right? If the sorting takes nine minutes, then I would optimize the sort. If the sorting takes 0.2 seconds, then there's no point optimizing the sorting, you work on the other parts of the problem. So uh, one way to answer that question is, to the degree that sorting starts to become a problem, people work on it, right? And they try to apply more sophisticated algorithms. In a lot of cases, with the sorting kind of data sets that people use on a daily basis, it doesn't matter, right? If I'm sorting 10,000, 100,000 items even, you know, the amount of time it takes to do that sort is so insignificant that it doesn't make sense to optimize. Once I need to sort billions, trillions, you know, you know, quadrillions of records, right? Then I start to care. Right, and that's why if you look at the sorting challenge, those are the problems they're trying to solve. Right. So yeah, to the degree that, and, and that's also the place where I start to try to figure out, are there features of the data that I can use to optimize the problem? Right, does, 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 does my sort always have this one particular property that I can basically use to make it faster? Good question. So, so the answer is probably, there's a general purpose sorting algorithm built into every language that people use 99% of the time. And then for that other 1% of problems, I start to think harder about how to solve it in a way that's, that's really based on the constraints of the particular problem. Good question. Other questions about sorting? Sorting, searching, good stuff. Okay, I will, uh, I'm gonna put this on as I leave. Didn't, you know, no exciting announcements today. I have office hours as usual from, uh, from you guys are like stunned. You're like, what? Um, Oh, you can go. Oh, you guys all want to watch the sorting video. Okay. Um, so I'll be around my office one to three today. Uh, good luck finishing up MP4. Uh, here's our exciting um, 15 sorting algorithms in 15 minutes. So this is.